Now to a dire warning about climate change. According to a new report, experts say that we have until 2030 to avoid catastrophe. It also says if unprecedented changes are not made and made soon, there will be irreversible damage to the planet. Environmental organizations say humans are to blame for fires devastating the Amazon, a region vital to our planet's climate. More than 74,000 fires have begun in Brazil this year, with roughly 40% in the Amazon area alone. Cities across the country are facing what the nonprofit Ecology Center has called a slow moving recycling crisis. Towns are struggling to deal with piles of plastic, paper, scrap metal, and other materials with no clear destination. Look at what her movement has become. This will be the largest climate protest in our planet's history. Record heat waves here. Look at this. The furthest retreat inland. Scientists have been warning us about climate change. Climate change. Climate change. Climate change. Climate change. As oceans continue to rise. In more erratic, erratic weather. Dangerous. It turns out that this model of climate change communication is wrong. Scientifically speaking, they're correct. But I think we also need a story about if we change to the best products, the best technologies we have today, we might bring down emissions very quickly. And this way we can turn our society around, creating much better lives with much lower resource use. Climate activists, people who want this to happen, should know that first of all, we're social beings. We need to believe that others are doing it for me to really put the effort into it. My journey um, started really once I had kids. I mean, obviously I knew about climate change and I was worried about it before, but once I had children, I really, really started to live a cleaner and healthier life because I wanted to give the best to my children. I had a mom who worked a lot. Her career was very, very important to her. I do think that I got a lot of toys to, you know, fill whatever room. The happiest memories that I have is spending time with my grandfather. For him, it was not about the toys. It was not, it, it was not about sitting down and playing with me a game or anything. It was just going outside. He had a lot of siblings who lived on the farm. They grew all their food. They were very sustainable. And that's what my love for growing and gardening came from. I grew up in San Diego. We lived near the beach. And I think as I grew up, there was a big focus on academics as well as sports, working hard, but not necessarily struggling, which I didn't really think about. And I found that at many steps of this journey, I would kind of shy away from the struggle. We live a zero waste lifestyle and the sustainable, trying to live as kind to the planet as possible. We grow pretty much all the vegetables and food that we eat in this house. We live on a standard city lot. It's just about 7,500 square feet, but we use the space really well. So we really grow on all the space we have in the front of the house and the back of the house, um, and then leave some fun room for the kids to have a great childhood as well. We don't need one person doing perfect zero waste. We need lots of people doing imperfect zero waste. People believe that you have to live out in the forest, you have no electricity, and there are people who do that, and I admire them. Um, but we are a zero waste family who lives in the middle of an urban city. We do drive one car that we share, and we bike. We have a bike that we brought home from Sweden. We get all sorts of people waving at us and saying, <laughs> cool bike, as we, as, as we go around town. Well, we but call we, it the company car. That's right, that's right. Since I'm from Sweden, we do automatically go to Sweden. It's something we can't change, but we also do like to travel. Our kids have been to a lot of countries. France, France, Switzerland. It's different spending time at home, where we also have chores, or spending time going away somewhere to explore something new. We, we like exploring the world with our children. All right, you guys ready for a zero waste lunch? Me. Yeah! How much do you think we spent on this lunch? I don't know, two dollars? If you count the coffee? <laughs> Probably at most. So, before we had children, 
We lived a high life. We did have a lot of money on paper. James had helped found a company. He worked a million hours a day, seven days a week. I never saw him. We had a 2,000 square feet house. But I was not very happy because he was never home. He always thought about the next step, always being a little bit negative even. It was hard for the kids. They, they didn't naturally go to him. It was naturally me that they gravitated to. I didn't feel like we had open and honest um, communication back then. I can see that. Before the Zero Waste journey, my dad, he was really stressed out. He worked a lot. He wasn't really happy. He, we barely got to see him. He would be there for the morning to drop us off at school, but he wouldn't come home till like middle of dinner and then we would have to go to bed right away. So we really didn't get to see him a lot. What we found as we kind of both reevaluated everything we were doing and started making different choices as to how we were spending our time and how we were spending our money, we were able to dramatically cut back our budget, which then really opened the door for, wow, you know, why are we spending all this time working and killing ourselves when ultimately spending time with our family is a really important, you know, value to us. Well, we have learned to live way more on less. Yeah. We always lived in flocks and tribes, and still our brain always scans my friends. What do they think? What does he say? What does she think? And I monitor that much more than I monitor far away changes such as how the mountain or the Arctic goes. So to us, what my peers do is paramount. We really need to feel that we're part of a larger community when we take climate action. Oh, are you eating well, my tomatoes? No, you look so nice. Thank you. I got you zucchini and broccoli and green beans. And would you like some cabbage too? Oh, look, yeah. can I put them in here? I met Frederica and James years ago because our kids go to the same school. One of the things that I really connected with them on is how easy it was to become their friend. They just immediately like invite you in and welcome you. She's known in our community and very loved. I would say an inspirational figure and like she brings a lot of people together. And there's a really good response to that. We have always aspired to have a huge community around us because we believe that's, that's the essence of life, to have lots of friends and uh, fun with friends. And one thing is to open our home to like anyone can come by. We grow way more vegetables than we will ever eat. So why not like share it with, with your friends and neighbors if they want them. I just see how the kids love to come into the garden and look at things and connect, uh, whether it's with the bugs and the worms, uh, or whether it's with the plants and the vegetables or the soil. It's just, uh, it's, it's really fun for them. We as a society have become so disconnected from where we get our food. The greatest place to learn about crops and growing and, and actually local produce is to go to the farmer's market. That's what we do. I love to go and talk to the vendors that I buy our food from. Another place that we go and learn a lot is our local nursery. Usually you can find there everything when it comes to growing. I feel a garden is a gateway to slowing life down, to putting value on food as far as quantity, quality, educational background. There's so much you can learn and teach 
from the gardening experience, which it also includes bettering the quality of the earth in general. We've been heading for zero waste for years. The challenges are the outside world that you gotta live with. Eventually, the zero waste can work on a larger scale, but for right now, it has to start at home and build its way up. Hey, James. Yeah. This is the butter that I made. You should try it. I, I add a little bit of nutritional yeast. Tastes great. Ah, the kids are great. Mm. The last yeah. one was a little bit heavy on the coconut oil. We get asked the question a lot, is this really hard to do? I understand that because, you know, like if you go to the store, there's all these prepackaged foods and all these things to, to make life really easy. In reality, once you've really learned the skill, you can do this so fast, much faster than even just driving down the road to the store and coming back. You can have it done before you're, b before you're back. You know, I have the sense that there are just these basic skills that p of things that people have been doing forever that in the last 50 or 60 years have just kind of become lost. So should we be doing um, just some makeup remover that I, I use to remove my makeup, but you could use it for cleaning your face with too. Okay. Did, you, did you cut any towels, yep. little pieces right for me? Oh, how pretty. One of the things that uh, you're taught is that you need a different cleaning product for every different part of the house. In reality, um, that's really just silly. In fact, uh, making your own cleaning products is so super fast and simple. There we go. Yay, we're done. Yay you have one for your bathroom, I have one for mine. I have mustard. Um, what? Cleaner. <laughs> All right. We also made dishwashing powder, which to be honest was probably not the height of success. Uh, I think sometimes uh, it's good to try these things and look at it. It always, we could never get it not to leave a film on the dishes and so then we just had to seek out, all right, who out there is making dishwasher detergent that is sustainable and is natural and comes in uh, plastic-free plastic uh, <laughs> packaging that we can get. And we finally found one uh, at our local zero waste store. Each step of the way, we, we figure things out. I had this idea to take the trash can from under our sink and I moved it into the hall closet. As you literally took 10 seconds to walk to the end of the hall to put the trash there, it gives you 10 seconds to think about, <laughs> like, what is this thing? Why do I have it? And why am I producing this trash? And it really was very powerful to get every member of the family to think differently because this was one really simple thing you can do. If you rearrange the situation, so it's uh, easier for people to take the right choice. And you now take constructive choices because you arranged it so that when you don't pay attention, you take the right choice. That's nudging. It's about rearranging the choice architecture so that it's easier for me to pick the climate friendly option. It's easier for me to pick that one that is best for me if it's set up in this way. When you go zero waste, you can't really care what people think of you. Uh, because I know for a fact that some people think that we are probably a little bit nuts, a little quirky, and sometimes just completely crazy. The difference between me and James is that I kind of more like, well, this is what we do. Woohoo, let's go out and do this. <laughs> yeah, when I grew up, you definitely didn't get extra points for sticking out, right? And so to start to kind of do things differently than everybody else or to be inconvenient uh, was definitely a bit of a mindset shift for me. I remember when Frederick came home and said, we're gonna um, use these soap nuts for our, our laundry rather than regular detergent. And my immediate reaction was, there's just no way that's gonna get her clothes clean. I mean, like laundry detergent, like comes in a box. It smells right? strong. And it, and it has like Tide written on it. That's how clothes get clean. Like how are these little, these little nuts gonna possibly clean our clothes? And you know, after a while I'm just like, hmm, well, this actually do a really great job. You know, when I look around now, I think you just have to kind of be comfortable in the shoes that you walk in. That is a four crackers. Huh? I want the homemade crackers. Okay. I was nine when we started Zero Waste. Things I didn't really understand was like, well, why do we need to take away the trash can? Everyone else has it. Why don't they take it away? It's kind of like not fair, I guess. 
I was a little jealous because like everyone else got to go get candy that was wrapped in plastic for Friday nights and I had to stick with my mom's homemade popcorn. But you know, my mom's popcorn was good so it was fine. <laughs> There are particular challenges trying to live zero waste as a family. You know, we've got three young kids, and so all the things that they will either need or enjoy or want has a particular challenges for figuring out how, as parents, do we navigate uh, this zero waste lifestyle with them. We weren't going to buy stuff in plastic, and there was so much I wanted to buy that wasn't plastic, but we couldn't because it was a challenge. We had to do without it. I think that plastic is one of the biggest challenges that our generation has to deal with. It is actually really hard to live your life, especially with kids, without having plastic come into your life in some way. What is this, by the way? Uh, How did that get in your bed? What is that? A Uh-huh. Okay, I'm not sure where that came from. All right. So when we throw away plastic or we try to recycle it. It doesn't really go away. We can try to upcycle it, we can try to recycle it, but the fact is plastic will be here long after we're gone and our grandkids are gone. The plastic will still be here. <laughs> Bye, take me home. It was hard being different the first year, but after the first year it was pretty easy because some people started thinking it was cool how different in like a ways I was. Is it weird that uh, Bella never brings any like trash to school in terms of like her lunch or anything like that? No, I think it's really cool that she doesn't and it's really good for the environment, so it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> what we learned early on is that kids can actually be a lot happier when they don't have a lot of toys. Noah, do you wish you had more toys? Uh, yeah. What kind of toys would you want? When they come and say, hey, um, mom, I'm bored, or dad, I'm bored, one of the magical things that we learned was to just say, okay. Because the time that they have the most fun playing and the most creative play happens about 10 or 15 minutes after they're complaining that they're bored and have no idea what to do. It's a natural thing for children to want. We try to work with them, so we don't deny them. If they want to get something, really, really, really want it, they should get it. We like to play games a lot with my parents. I like to help them water the garden, it's fun. And my mom, she helps me cook and stuff, so it's really fun. I definitely think that us spending so much time together is making us a happier couple. The value of spending time with the kids and raising children to be these really balanced people that are going to make a difference on this planet the only way to really do that is to really have the time with them to kind of teach and guide and guide them uh, to that place. Hi. Hi. I'm Sadia. Hi. Rika. Hi. Hello, James. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Hi. I'm Sarah. Hello, oh, Sarah Hi. James. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hey, Kip. Welcome. Thanks. Meal. Nice to meet you. All right. Wow, that is impressive. Come on back. Wow. Yeah, we, we started this project I love it. just a little over two years ago. Wow. Fruit tree corridor here uh, that gets mostly irrigated from our uh, from our laundry, actually. Huh. Uh, kind of under, we've got a... Oh, okay. This is all from the, the broccoli's from the garden? Yes. Yeah. Broccoli's from the garden. Yeah. 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 Cheers. 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 <laughs> <laughs> So going back to your your story mm -hmm. and how you arrived at this kind of simple life. Four months ago, we had a fire. So the, our house didn't burn down, but we lost everything. We had to go through all our stuff. Our house was emptied out. Now, in putting it back in, do we really want that in there or do we need that? No. It's so easy for things to creep in. We looked at ourselves and went, why is it that every time we walk into Target for like two things, we walk out with 10? Right. My perspective on it has been with all the kind of fear rhetoric of what's happening to the planet, the problem is, you know, the human mind shuts down. When you think about it from a positive 
it's very hard for someone to say, well, this is not for me. It's for all of us then, right? I, I feel like, you know, that's really where the conversation needs to be. I believe in that I want to give people the tools because I saw for my kids, if I'm sitting here like, yep, climate change is happening, like your plan is going to yeah. hell. <laughs> Sorry, right, kids. Right. Good luck to you. I mean, that's not fair. Right. So what I'm doing, I'm giving my kids the tools how like, this is what we do because of this. I think as humans, we desire to do more and more and more. And as we bring more things into our life, more activities, more things, more work, um, more money, it leads to companies then stepping in to say, oh, I need to help you make your life easier. You've just made your life so complicated, so busy. Let us help you out with these products to simplify your life. <laughs> But your individual choices can slowly, as we all kind of come together, influence companies. And they do have a big role in this. Like, they do have to start thinking more creatively about, well, how can we use less plastic in the things that we're actually selling, right? They have to start taking more responsibility. We're not just going to be able to do it alone. Individual actions may influence more individuals and more individuals, so like ripples in the water, our norms change and gradually we build a bottom-up support for structural or political changes. That is important, but I don't think that by itself is enough. We do need this kind of citizens' engagement, but we also need to have government interventions that work from the top down. And thirdly, we need business. We need new products, new services, new technologies, better innovations. In this way, we have a triangle consisting of citizens, businesses and government. And all these three need to reinforce each other for the whole system to change. When I think about what's next for us, I really think about building community around what we've been learning the thing that surprised me is how many people are interested to learn about what we're doing. We can think bigger. We can start with our school here in San Diego, but there are many schools who's gonna wanna join this. We really just wanna grow that and share this knowledge. And I'm really excited where this is gonna take us.